Before we start on the announced subject, which was to be a um, review of the steps of production of green spirits and green whiskey in this country, I uh, thought some of you might be interested in a little figures I calculated in reference to the great concentrator we saw at the Bear Creek yesterday. There were several questions asked about it. And uh, <clears throat> Our guide, Mr. Mettler, had indicated the feed rate and the product rate. But of course, if you have one or the other, you calculate the other with the specifications they gave. So I calculated out to see how it agreed, and it sort of roughly agrees. But uh, here's the way you, here's your way you do it. <clears throat> For example, well, <coughs> schematically, this uh, <coughs> this device was. Um, something like this, an outline in which we had a material at the bottom here went through a pump. And, uh, <clears throat> and this was, uh, this went to a steam heater, which I'll indicate <coughs> here, the, the shell and tube here with, <clears throat> that'll be the <clears throat> tubes here. These may not, this is not a very proper, proper size probably, but anyway, then this, the vapor of this went into the, went into the, <clears throat> the body, and then there's a vapor pipe up to the condenser here, <clears throat> which I will show on this. And of course, steam was being injected into the heaters. Of course, the steam condensate would be coming out here, but then, Somewhere I don't remember exactly. Uh, then, the, then the feed was introduced and, and mixed with this stream into the bottom, <coughs> going to the bottom of that heater. So, in other words, there's a continuous circulation of the liquid, which is a, he had a sight glass on here to show the liquid level. And uh, <clears throat> so he said that there was a 1,200 gallons per hour feed here. This would be the feed. Of juice at 19 bricks, and uh, he said the product, which we can take out, probably it'll be taken. I, I didn't examine it closely, but I imagine it was taken out of the outflow of this pump before it's mixed with the feed. You see, it, anyway, it could be taken out here. So we call this a product or concentrate. Sixty-eight about bricks. And of course, then it went through a cooler, I think. He said it went through a cooler, but and on to the receiving tank storage. <clears throat> well, in other words, and then they said that the boiling point in here was somewhere, the thermometer read 100, 108. He said he thought it was about 112. So I don't know. Anyway, yeah, it is a, <coughs> 108 to 112 was the degrees Fahrenheit was the boiling temperature of the liquid. <clears throat> I'll think I'll consider that in a minute. So, in other words, if you want, we, I was going to calculate the product rate here. 108 to 112 for centigrade or Fahrenheit? Fahrenheit. All right. <clears throat> so anyway, I, I decided I'd calculate what this product rate is here, and uh, let's call that. Uh, Let's call that C for concentrate in gallons per hour. So we can calculate what it would be by our technique of material balances again. So the facts are that 19 degrees bricks is a And it's the basic definition is a solution of sucrose and water, which would be 19% by weight, or any other solution that has the equivalent density or specific gravity. And the specific gravity at 20 degrees centigrade or 68 degrees Fahrenheit is 
1.0784. 68 degrees bricks, which is what they aim for in the product, has, has, a, has a specific gravity of 1.3371. You can look these up in standard tables like the AOAC manual. And so, if we want to equate the entering to the uh, what goes in equal to what goes out, in terms of sugar now, we're going to have a sugar balance or soluble solids balance. And so we have to convert the gallons per hour, 1,200 gallons per hour, All right, gallons per hour, <coughs> times the density of a gallon, which is the density of water times the specific gravity, which is 1.0784 times 8.33 pounds per gallon, all multiplied by 0 0.19 will give it, or in other words, 19 mass fraction would be the amount of sugar, wouldn't it? Entering, that would be the amount of sugar entering, or soluble solids. <clears throat> The amount leaving would be uh, whatever they are unknown here, which I use the symbol C and concentrate in gallons per hour. Times the um, specific gravity uh, or, or the density, uh, with the, which is uh, 1.3371 times <coughs> 8.33. That'll be the pounds of concentrate per hour times the concentration of soluble solids, which is 0 0.68, would be the amount of sugar. So in other words, we can solve for C. Well, as you can see, of course, uh, to get the answer in pounds per gallon, the density of water cancels here, of course, and like that. So it's a <clears throat> so uh, solving for C, which is equal to uh, 1,200 times uh, 1.0784 divided by 1.3371 times 0 0.19 divided by 0 0.68 equals about 270 gallons per hour. That's the way. If you want to check me with your little clock calculator, I just went through this once. He did. He told us that he thought it was about 200 gallons per hour product rate. It seems to me like uh, I couldn't find my notes from last year. It seemed like the other man told me that the, uh, it seemed like it was more like 1,000 gallons per hour instead of 1,200. So I don't know. Anyway, it's, it's the same it's the or, same order of magnitude, but should it be a little larger than what he stated yesterday, the man that took, showed us yesterday? Because essentially no place for it to be lost. <laughs> <laughs> He's either ha he either has less uh, lower bricks if he's only getting 200 gallons per hour, or uh, he's not measuring the outflow quite right. <clears throat> Maybe the wrong with the wrong temperature, not a, not the right temperature correction. You wouldn't expect to get uh, quite this much, though. This is the ideal amount, right? Well, there's a little loss, but I, I would imagine it's less than 1%. Uh, so uh, that would be maybe a couple gallons less. Well, but maybe we've misunderstood him, or I think he may have forgotten what the figures were. Mm -hmm. Anyway, another point that I made in calculating that I thought might be of interest was we read the temperature, this temperature I just put up here. It also had a vacuum gauge on it, but it was reading over 30 inches of vacuum, which is obviously impossible. So uh, <coughs> you can take the temperature, if you're going to trust the temperature gauges, and calculate what the pressure would be inside. So I did that, so I'll just show you how that will go. So if you had. Um, I, I just uh, said that um, I just took 110 because he, even though the reading was said this, he thought it was he thought the value was about four degrees higher. Well, let's say 
let's assume the temperature was the boiling temperature of the liquid, boiling point of the liquid <clears throat> was 110 degrees Fahrenheit. All right. Now uh, you have to consider the boiling point rise if you want to know what the actual pressure is here, because there's enough at 68 bricks, which is essentially concentration of liquid in here. Why well, you have um, that means you got 68 grams of sugar per 100 grams of solution, which means 68 grams of sugar per 32 grams of water, which using them, figuring the molality, in other words, which the, the number of moles per 1,000 grams of water, 1,000 grams of solvent, comes out to be about, um, I think it's almost 12 more, 11.8 more. In other words, <clears throat> 68 bricks means 68 grams of sugar, which we'll call hexose in this case, per 100 grams of solution, which is equal to 68 grams per 32 grams of water, <coughs> times 1,000, of course, would be the <coughs> grams would be equal to the grams of hexose per 1,000 grams of, of water. And so uh, the, um, the molecular weight, if we assume it's hexose sugar, sucrose or levulose, which grape sugar is essentially that, the molecular weight is uh, 180, to the round numbers. And so the number of moles per Thousand grams of solvent would be would be uh, <coughs> moles <coughs> per thousand grams of solvent would be equal to uh, sixty-eight times a thousand over thirty-two divided by one hundred and eighty, which I got as eleven point eight eleven point eight molar molal. And the boiling point rise, standard boiling point rise for water, boiling point rise is 0 0.514 degrees centigrade per mole. As per mole of, and so the so then we'd have 11.8 times 0 0.514, which is uh, about 6.07 degrees centigrade. Now, yeah. or about 10.9 or 11 degrees Fahrenheit. We'll probably 1.8 to get to Fahrenheit. <clears throat> and so now then, um, if you want to So now then, if we say that the boiling point here was 110, we have to, the, the, the boiling point of the vapor that would be in equilibrium with that would be, uh, the, boiling, the vapor pressure of water would be 11 degrees less. So the true, bo the true boiling point, the true boiling point uh, of, of water, the true boiling point of water At the pressure, uh, at the pressure used, would be equal to 110 minus 11, or 99 degrees Fahrenheit. <clears throat> now you can look up the standard table, vapor pressures, boiling points. Engineers use a use a little book called steam tables. You also find that in textbooks. But you can look up in here in a column and find that for <clears throat> temperature of 99 degrees Fahrenheit, the uh, ab absolute pressure of water vapor or, um, is about 0.92 pounds per square inch. All right. <clears throat> but the... Uh, not a racist. <clears throat> so... 
at 99 degrees Fahrenheit, the saturation temperature of water vapor is uh, about, I mean, the pressure is, uh, what did I say, 0 0.92 pounds per square inch absolute, PSIA. Hmm? We're not talking about, we're not talking about, I'm talking about uh, delta T, or in other words, the boiling point rise. It's in the absolute temperature. It means it's, the 6.07 degrees centigrade is the number of degrees elevation, the boiling point elevation. And one, the magnitude of a, of, a, of a degree centigrade is 1.8 times a degree Fahrenheit, right? Nine fifths. So it's 10 or 11 degrees Fahrenheit. If this was 6.7 degrees centigrade, uh, I mean, uh, referred to uh, referred to the standard temperature scale, well, of course, it's, it's not 10 degrees Fahrenheit. You'd have to add the 32 and introduce the 32 factor. But the no, six, six degrees, where you pick them out where they are, is equal to 11 degrees or 10.9 degrees Fahrenheit. In this operation, uh, you have the steam and the water that's uh, taking off the product going out the top there where you have to have some feedback out the bottom for the concentrate into the tank, don't you? Well, I didn't draw, I didn't draw the, I didn't draw the condenser and the, and the barometric leg and the, and, the, and the water circulation system, the condensing part. This course, the vapor goes to the condenser. I'm just, we're not really interested in the water part except to, we're not talking about distillation now. We're talking about evaporation. Yeah, well, it's a vaporization process. The only thing that the only thing that leaves here is water. A small amount of entrainment of vapor of, of droplets, but uh, all, the, all this this a mixture of vapor and liquid will come in here, and it, it comes in sort of tangentially, and it gives a swirling action, so that the vapors disengaged and goes up and the liquid goes down. And uh, it, it's being operated in, in such a manner that uh, 19 degrees bricks here ends up at 68 here. Let me finish this part. <clears throat> so in other words, um, in other words, the actual pressure in there was, as I estimated by this procedure, is about 0.92 pounds per square inch absolute. Or in other words, nearly one pound per square inch less than atmospheric. Well, I put there, I got, I got it down here. That's <clears throat> so in other words, the, the, uh, <clears throat> since one, atm the actual, the actual, the, um, the gauge pressure, if you want to say then, gauge pressure would be equal to 0 0.92 minus 14.70, which is a pounds per square inch absolute for one, for one uh, atmosphere. You know, that's one, at, one atmosphere. Or in, in other words, minus uh, <clears throat> 13, uh, 0.78 carried out to that little extreme. <clears throat> That'd be minus PSIG, pounds per square inch gauge. In other words, you have a gauge there. It should, in calibrated pounds per square inch, it should read about 13, 8 tenths pounds negative or a vacuum side. Sometimes you have com compound gauges that will read zero in the middle and positive pressure to the right and negative pressure to the left. Well, if you've had a pounds per square inch gauge, this would be reading to the left, negative, with respect to atmospheric pressure. <clears throat> so that's the reason we write PSIG, or pounds per square inch gauge. However, their gauge reads, reads in inches of mercury, mercury vacuum, inches of vacuum, inches of mercury vacuum, 
So how would you get that? Well, there's several ways you can convert it, but <clears throat> one atmosphere or 14.7 pounds per square inch is also equal to 29.92 inches of mercury. That's 760 millimeters. <clears throat> Same as 760 millimeters. But in inches, it's 29.92. <clears throat> so in other words, if you wanted to read, if you had a vac for a vacuum gauge then, to read in inches of mercury, you would say that the, the vacuum would be equal to uh, <clears throat> 2992 hundredths times uh, what the pressure is here, what the negative pressure is, 13.78, or in other words, is about, uh, well, divide by 14.70, which is about 28 inches of vacuum. 28 inches of vacuum. Now that's a term that <clears throat> they use in the industry quite a bit to represent the, uh, the evaporator pressure. How'd you get from uh, 99 Fahrenheit to 0.92 pounds per square inch? I heard that out of the table. Oh, okay. <clears throat> in other words, at 99 degrees Fahrenheit, you would have in, in a saturated system, saturated, if you had a a liquid at that temperature and the, and the vapor is in equilibrium with it at the top. The vapor pressure would be 0.92 pounds per square inch, or roughly, um, what is that, 50 or 60 millimeters of mercury. You can look it up in millimeters of mercury in handbooks and convert it the same way. I don't, I don't understand about the vacuum. And why we use the vacuum? Well, uh, the, the reason that we use the reason they use a vacuum in, uh, in um, evaporating um, food products is in, is to reduce the temperature of boiling and therefore uh, minimize the amount of thermal degradation of uh, flavors and organic materials. So that's the only reason. A lot of people get the false idea that. Concentrators or evaporators are operated in a vacuum because it takes less energy. I mean, low temperature, like 100. Or, you could go put your hand on that. That'd be just barely warm. This evaporator. <clears throat> but uh, in reality, that's that's, uh, <coughs> that's not correct. As a matter of fact, the heat of vaporization is greater at the low pressures than it is at high. So it takes a little bit more energy in the reality. So uh, you're not saving energy by using a vacuum. You're simply doing it to decrease the possible damage to the <coughs> materials. There are evaporators that are used in, in um, chemical industry, especially to make inorganic salts, which are rel relatively <coughs> free of uh, Thermal degradation, where they, they operate them at positive pressures, high temperatures. <clears throat> there are disadvantages, of course, to using vacuum, too low vacuums. One, uh, one is the difficulty of maintaining it. Another is um, 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 viscosity effects. The lower temperature you use, the more viscous materials are, and when they're very thick like this, pretty viscous anyway, especially, but it would be, a, if you had it down to room temperature, it'd be very syrupy. Well, I thought, I thought that this wasn't on the schedule here, but I thought you might be interested in uh, <coughs> elaborating on it since we saw it yesterday. Could you give us a diagram, sort of that economizer thing that was at the bottom of the still on still? Well, let me bring it, I'll bring it in in a later period. I'll give you a, pre, a reprint of it of a diagram I have, and then discuss it then. <clears throat> when did you write your paper on the, the aspect of the interface between joy and motion? Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's your leisure, isn't it? <laughs> well, that brings up a good subject here. I, I think we uh, need to have something to illustrate or give you some practice in. 
solving a distillation problem by the Cape, Cape Thiele method. So I want to hand that out, and then I'll get to the announced subject here. <clears throat> uh, I decided to give you a problem that um, I've used before, but uh, and I, but with a couple changes, I'll give it. So I'll take one of these exercises here, and then I'll explain what the changes are. <clears throat> I didn't have an opportunity to get it reprinted. <clears throat> well, all right now, um, make these corrections on here. And write it, write in, uh, hand in either Wednesday, Thursday, first of October, or Thursday. 1st of November. If I don't say that, you let it go after the quiz and you might need to have this practice before the quiz. <laughs> Isn't that lo logical? Logic? All right. <clears throat> now I think, we, I think this is problem set five or exercise five. And so you strike out under, ex under the first paragraph there, one, two, and three. We don't, I don't want you to do that plotting. That's a, what we really want to work is what's called exercise two there, the problem itself. So in other words, uh, we'll work the, the particular problem as stated, except when it comes down to part C, I'll ask you to cross out the word indicate graphically so that the thing reads how many plates would be needed in each section if the feed is at some colder temperature, namely 100 degrees Fahrenheit, instead of, for example, calculate, in other words, calculate 400 degrees Fahrenheit. <coughs> I'll give you a hint. Uh, I think the little handout that I had on the McCabe Thiele method, on the last page, which showed the method of calculating the Q value is for this exact conditions. <laughs> so you don't really have to work anything except read it off of what I already handed out. <clears throat> if I had given you some other temperature than 100, it would have been a little more. So then uh, all you need now is, to, uh, oh yeah, and then add one more part D down at the bottom here. One more question, which is rather simple. If the average plate efficiency that is in the concentrating section, is 75%. What are the approximate temperatures on the actual trays numbered respectively 4, 8, and 12 from the top? In other words, in this answer, you'll get, I don't know, maybe 9 or 10 or 11 or 12. I don't know. I, I think it's over 9 anyway. Uh, <clears throat> uh, ideal trays. Well, of course, if it's 75% uh, efficient, well, that means you have to use uh, 4 for each 3, doesn't it? <laughs> ideal trays. <laughs> well, in other words, you had 4 actual trays, and there's 75% efficient. That would be 3 fourths of, uh, of 4 would be 3 ideal trays. So in other words, if you, if you measure off three ideal trays, in reality, you've got to have four trays to make a, to have real trays. Mm -hmm. <coughs> which trays did you want? Hmm? Uh, looked at and which numbers? Numbers four, eight, and 12, measured from the top. <clears throat> That'd be one, two, three, four, and then eight, and so on down. <clears throat> All right, now, you could use this graph I used I handed out before for this purpose, except it doesn't work very well down in the stripping section. 
So I got out my supply of an expanded plot here. And it turns out to be I'm a little bit short of a copy. So I, uh, I think there's, a, I think there's a one here for every. Um... <laughs> oink, oink, oink. Come on, I want to hear it. For every registered student. So if you're just an auditor, uh, don't, don't take one unless there's some excess here. <clears throat> I'm a little, I'll get some more runoff. I'll get some more runoff, but I am. Um, In other words, I don't think you'll find this too difficult. Now, uh, the only thing about this particular graph that may be a little confusing because just for uh, general information, the equilibrium curve is plotted on a volume percent basis and a, and a mass percent or weight percent basis as well as mole. So, of course, the volume and weight uh, equilibrium curve you'll ignore. They could just as well not have been on there <clears throat> because we're this McCabe and Thiele method, as you know, has to be worked with on a mole basis. Otherwise, our just major assumption that we made of equal molal overflow, uh, equal molal heats of vaporization, and, uh, couldn't be uh, wouldn't uh, couldn't be used. <clears throat> so, in other words, in, in essence, then you you use the main curve there to work it for the. Um, concentrating section, and then down there in that lower right-hand corner, there's a little there's a little expanded plot. Note, of course, that the vertical scale is somewhat larger than the horizontal scale. But in other words, you could, uh, be, uh, by work using that little expanded scale for the tripping section, you will come out. Um, with steps that you can read, if you otherwise it gets steps or gets too small. Now I could have given you a simplified problem like how many places it take to separate a feed mixture of 25 mole percent into a distillate of 75 mole percent and a bottom product of 5 mole percent, and uh, you draw the, with a certain reflux ratio. So you draw the lines in there and uh, draw the lines in there and, uh, and measure them off, and it'd be very simple. You could do it in five minutes once you had the slope, figured out the slope. But in the case of our uh, industry, uh, the alcohol uh, industries, uh, five mole percent, what does that mean? If you had a bottom product of five mole percent, according to my um, tables here, that would be um, about five mole percent is about um, 12 percent by weight, 13 or 14 percent by volume, what what realistic situation would, could we have where that would be, that, in other words, it's not, it's an unreal, it'd be a non-realistic situation, unrealistic situation. So I've given you a real situation. And it does make the steps very small down the stripping section. So anyway, that's, so that's why I've given this a little more, slightly more complicated plot. <clears throat> As I said before, I won't be here um, next week, but I will be in on the following Monday, so um, if you want to come in, if you have problems with it, come in and see me then. Or, or, oh no, that's the, no, that's, that's uh, no, this is next week, I don't know. If you want to, no, I want this done this week, yeah. So I won't be here, so I have to struggle with it yourself. Is that all right? Quiz is next Thursday, we can That's what I announced, okay, that's what we'll do. Well, all right. Why don't you put it off another week? All right. Well, for the remainder of the period, we'll talk about. Um, can we take one of these, please? And You can see uh, Mr. Um, Alioto or Mr. Kroll, they probably can help you a little bit if they uh, 
need help. But it's really quite simple. I've already figured out and put down at the bottom there the conversion of volume percent to weight percent to mole percent, so you don't even have to look up in the tables. <laughs> so in other words, all you have to you're almost ready to start drawing your graph uh, right right off. We are ready to start drawing your graph right off. <clears throat> Now I had indicated that um, I was going to uh, go through an outline here of the steps used in the production of grain spirits or grain whiskey in the United States, primarily, uh, in, in principle, it, quite similar to that used elsewhere or other countries, but with some, some exceptions, which we'll point out in due course. <clears throat> um, I've just, we've classified the steps here uh, as a, in the general area of milling, uh, which, you could, which could include the receipt, storage, and handling of the grain. And the, the grains that are used are mostly corn, rye, and barley malt. Um, sometimes for grain spirits, some other grains are used like the milo grain and uh, there have been attempts to use rye and, and oats, but I mean uh, oats and um, wheat, but they have problems with those, and they're usually not economical, uh, as economical. So, um, uh, well, I'll just make, call your attention to a few points about this, and the, the last two pages is a, is a flow chart, taken out of a little brochure that I have had. And uh, although I got it stapled together, you see the two parts of it is really part of a continuous flow sheet, of a, a two-page size. So anyway, we we'll gonna say a few words about milling, mashing, the yeasting and fermentation, and um, recovery of residues warehousing and bottling. We won't have time to go into that very much. I'd like to just call your attention to a few words in the outline and then, then we'll turn our attention to the flow sheet and see if we can follow it through. Well, I don't think I'll spend much time on mills. I don't know, uh, as I, I understand now, the hammer mills are the type generally preferred, although older, uh, in, in older days, that usually this more simple ruler mills or attrition mills were used. You know what a attrition mill is? <laughs> you know what a roller mill is? <laughs> well, a roller mill would be rather simple in concept. Uh, there are different designs, of course, but if the grain or whatever is to be ground goes between two rolls or between a roll and some other uh, basin which the roller goes around. Attrition mill, the grain is ground between two plates one of which is rotating, or maybe they're both rotating, but at least one's fixed and one's rotating. They have grooves in it, so the grain is fed into that, and it's, the grinding is by the principle of attrition or rubbing. Is it spinning or just moving? No, it spins, driven. Sometimes it drive one plate and the other stationary, or sometimes it drive both plates in opposite directions. <clears throat> And hammer mills are various designs of that, but essentially that's a high-speed rotor with knives or, or hammers on it that uh, beat in, in a, inside a chamber the material up into smaller particles. Hammer mills are used in the grape industry to a certain extent, that, or it's frequently called disintegrators, to disintegrate pumice, grind up the solids so that they're finally divided and make a slurry. So anyway, the purpose of milling, of course, is to put in a grain form, reduce the particles to sizes where uh, they can be, uh, where they will react and uh, be dissolved and acted upon by the yeast. Now for uh, <clears throat> the label bourbon, the rye must contain at least 51% of a corn or maize. And um, 
of course, if it's going to be labeled rye whiskey, which is not very com common, so much common anymore as it used to be, and more common in the east than it is in the west, have to have 51%. The same old principle applies that we have for varietal labels on wines. The majority of the product has to be the name of the material used. Well, this is uh, to make it distinctively different from bourbon. Uh, So-called corn whiskey is um, a type that's produced um, mostly in the southern, for the south, southern states, some of which is legally done, some illegally done. <laughs> but uh, uh, several of the distilleries make a legal tax-paid product. And it's usually sold at, uh, it's usually aged in used barrels and, and uh, sold a rather light color and has a rather distinct flavor of corn. If you can know what that is. Mm -hmm. But nevertheless, it, um, at least in the uh, Kentucky, Ohio areas, the uh, typical mash bill for bourbon whiskey is somewhere 68 or 70 percent corn, about 20 percent rye, and 12 percent barley malt. <coughs> and so the procedure is to, uh, after the the ground, the ground, the meal is ground, and then it's mixed with water and a certain percent of the recycled stillage. That is, after the solids are screened out of the stillage, this clear stillage is run back through a cooler, and is, and um, some some stillage is put in instead of water. In other words, it's a water replacement. And the purpose of that is primarily to reduce the acidity or the pH, because there are acids produced, like succinic acid and lactic acid, during fermentation of a medium such as grain, which inherently does have, has very little natural acid, of course. <clears throat> but uh, this helps to lower the pH and, uh, and better control the fermentation purity, cleanliness. How lowers the pH or lowers the acid? Lowers the pH I, I forgot now. I, I, I forgot what the typical pH is. It's probably lowered to uh, somewhere in the 4.5, I think, range. Lowered from what? Well, uh, it'd be up, uh, probably in six range would be the uh, just plain cooked mash. There wouldn't be enough acidity to blow six, I don't think. I, I, I'm just guessing, I don't know exactly, but I think that'd be about right. And so, um, then this uh, material then is uh, cooked either uh, in batch cookers or in what they call continuous co tube co cookers. I think for the premium labels of bourbon, they generally prefer batch cookers. Even for some of the premium labels like um, I.W. Harper and um, Fitzgerald and so on, they actually cook it at atmospheric pressure just by steaming open tanks or tanks that are not uh, under pressure. So you don't get much more than 212 degrees Fahrenheit. You don't get as good a yield of alcohol from this, but uh, many of the older distillers claim that's better quality spirit that's produced from that. And, um, but the, and then some of them are uh, batch pressure cookers in which they are completely closed and the steam is um, applied, the heating is applied, and so the, they, op they may operate at 15 or 20 pounds per square inch pressure. Of course, there's agitators in there, stirrers, to keep it mixed while, during the cooking period. Other types of cookers are simply long tubes where it's kept, it's pumped through a long tube of sufficient size and length to give the desired holding time, which may be, I'm not sure now, 10 to 30 minutes or 40 minutes would be the order of magnitude. 30 minutes of cooking would be a kind of a typical on a batch cooker. I'm not quite sure about the holding time in the continuous cookers. So anyway, the purpose of cooking is to um, break down the starch, sort of liquefy the starch, and also sterilize the mash, because sterility is a very problem. The, the, the grain industry tends to, tries to operate sterile fermentations. It's a little different than the wine fermentations, which are far from sterile. <laughs> Start far from pure cultures, for example. They, so they try to operate with pure cultures. <clears throat> so, um, uh, after it comes out of the cooker, 
it's cooled down to a temperature which is intermediate temperature before the malt is added. In other words, they're around 150 degrees, and then the malt is added. And uh, this reduces it probably five degrees more, somewhere between 145 and 148. It's called the malting temperature. At that temperature, it's sort of a compromise between the uh, rapidity of the invert inverting of starch into, so into fermentable sugars by the enzymes of the malt and um, the heat degradation of the malt. In other words, the enzymes of the malt are, uh, are, uh, are damaged or destroyed eventually at 150 degrees, 145 degrees Fahrenheit. Perhaps <coughs> Mr. Lewis next week will have, say more about that. Does but uh, but, but that, that, is, that intermediate temperature is uh, one that which you give good, they found by experience, gives about the maximum conversion of fermentable sugars and the most economical malting temperature. Then, of course, it's cooled down to the fermentation of the temperature at which the fermenters are to be set. And uh, now in the next paragraph there, as I say, I would point out that uh, for the inoculation or the culture, they usually set, make a separate mash. All the mash bill, is, uh, the, the grains used in the mash are, are figured into the mash bill for the whole process. In other words, um, uh, the, the, the composition of the grains used in the yeast culture mash may be slightly different, but it, it comes out so it bounces up and gives the same figures that their bill is and, and, and records. As a matter of fact, they have to keep federal records of this in terms of pounds of grains used. Now that's where their official records begin, pounds of materials used. Like in the wine industry, we have to use either record mm -hmm. pounds of fruit or more likely gallons of, of wine. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> All right. Um, <clears throat> uh, the separate yeast culture, uh, separate mash is usually uh, prepared, sterile, sterilized, malt added, and then cooled. And then a frequent practice is to add a lactic acid culture, a lactic acid bacteria. I think it's called Delbruchii, if, uh, if those of you have had uh, that micro microbiology courses. And uh, th this is allowed to grow at a fairly high temperature, at least this manual said, 128, 130 degrees. This converts some of the sugars to lactic acid. And, uh, and um, then this is sterilized to kill the bacteria and then cool down and then inoculate with yeast, usually with a flask culture built up in the laboratory. And then probably two stages of tanks in the, in the plant. There'll be a flask in the laboratory put into a small tank in the plant and then that'll be transferred into a larger tank called a seed tank, let's say, in the, in the plant. <coughs> and that'll finally go into the fermenter. So the actual yeast culture that's used may have gone through four or five stages of culture starting with the, the laboratory. There's some idea that this gives better adaptation and better, better vigor of the yeast culture, better yields. <clears throat> the final yeast tank uh, is usually called a seed tank. Now the fermentation times, as I, I think I've indicated before, are, are try, usually they're tried to conduct it in either 72 hours or 96 hours. There was a three-day fermentation, a four-day fermentation. And so a uh, typical practice is uh, on Mo Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday of the week, they aim for the 72-hour uh, fermentation. And so they set the temperatures a little higher, 75 to 78 degrees Fahrenheit. <clears throat> and uh, they do pro provide some cooling. Usually it's cascade coolings over the outside of the tank, not internal coils. So in three days, the, the mash is ready to distill. For the latter part of the week, on Thursday, Friday, and Saturday, they set them at lower temperatures so that they'll, they can skip Sunday and start in with mash fermented in four days on Monday, do the distilling on Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesdays <coughs> because they're not permitted or don't work on Sundays. <coughs> Mr. Quatcha yesterday told us that, that they can't work on Sundays in the 
in the in the in the processing plant in the um, central cellars because um, they're not a producer. But over at the winery where they're fermenting, uh, they have a special provision to work on Sundays and around the clock that they want. <clears throat> well, anyways, now a few words about the distillation, and perhaps maybe we I could explain that better in a few minutes if we turn to the last page here. <clears throat> I think you can read to, you know, look through the chart yourself and figure out the flow pattern. Maybe we'll take a little more time later when we have <clears throat> to go through it more. But out of the fermenters, which is in the middle of the top page here, uh, or the first page, then it goes into a dumped into a beer well, <clears throat> uh, so-called. <clears throat> the fermented mash is called beer. And the first step in the distillation is to run it through a beer still. So if you're looking at the last page of this diagram, you'll see that the column on the left is labeled beer still. And it is simply a column with about 20 uh, sieve plates in it, perforated trays. The top section, um, three or four plates above the trays, maybe bubble caps so that they get a slight concentration effect. The beer is run through, in this case, the diagram shows three separate heat exchangers. But anyway, the first condensers are usually the beer heaters. And so it's preheated and then goes in near the top of the column. It's heated with, a, it's usually heated with a reboiler. You see the reboiler down at the bottom of the column, the uh, little horizontal tank uh, below the word stillage pre-evaporator unit. <clears throat> One very good reason why they use reboiler heating for the beer stills in the grain industry is the simple fact that they, ha they recover and evaporate all the water. They recover the soluble solids as well as the suspended solids and use them for feed materials and also to avoid pollution, streams and so forth from the stillage. <clears throat> and so you wouldn't want to use diluting steam. So that just increase your evaporation problems. They have to be all evaporated off. So they use indirect heat, reboiler, and so this keeps down the volume. <clears throat> For making the bourbon whiskey distillate, or what they call high wines, the vapor is passed off then to the final condenser, or the final two condensers. The the main condenser they is labeled here beer column defligmator, but still some uncondensed vapor goes over to the beer column gas cooler. That's really a little auxiliary small condenser to kind of make sure that the, all the alcohol is condensed out. <clears throat> the two streams are blended together, and you see part of it can be run back as reflux at the top of the column, or it can come down vertically here and go one of two directions, either to the left or the right. If it's to be bourbon whiskey distillate, it goes to the left, in this case, in this process anyway, into the so-called whiskey doubler, a little tank there just immediately to the right and in the lower part of the beer still. Now this is heated with steam, and this is called a continuous whiskey doubler, so all the distillates coming from the main beer still condensers, goes into the doubler. It's heated with a closed coil, and part of it is vaporized and condensed in the whiskey condenser above it. And of course, then flows out from the condenser to the receiving tanks. <clears throat> now, the, the liquid in the bottom of that doubler, which is the residual liquid from the vapor passing off, as the whiskey distillate is drawn out and pumped back into the upper part of the beer still continuously. In reality, that whiskey double is sort of is nothing more than a, one more stage of vaporization. In other words, the first distillate from the continuous beer still may vary from 90 to 130 proof, something that order. It can be controlled by controlling the amount of reflux run back. So typically, if you had a, let's say, a 100 proof distillate going into the doubler, one stage of vaporization would get it up to maybe 140 or 150. And the maximum proof of distillation is 160. 
permitted to be labeled bourbon. Now, if you, <clears throat> and time is up here, but I'll just say a couple words. If we're going to make green spirits, well, then the distillates in the beer still, instead of going into the doubler, would be diverted, in this case, into the so-called heads column. And you see there, if you take time to trace it out, that the whatever distillate there is, it would be called heads, and the bulk of that would be a relatively small volume, and the bulk of the spirit would go out the bottom and be labeled unfinished spirits. And then this is shown as going into another column called an extraction column. <clears throat> and if they're going to call it an extraction column, why they in introduce hot water up at the top. Now the hot water, if you trace all the errors out, comes from the bottom product from the spirits column, the last column on the right. You see the hot water pump, and that goes back here. It can go one of two ways, but it goes up near the top of the extraction column. That permits <clears throat> distilling uh, the most of the congeners over in a low alcohol strength distillate, in the, in the, in the top distillate. <clears throat> but considerable amount of that, then the bulk of the alcohol, of course, will come out the bottom again, also called unfinished spirits. So in other words, the unfinished spirits then, down at the bottom, are fed into the final concentrating column, or rectifying column, spirits column that's labeled here, from which um, <clears throat> high quality spirits drawn off as a side stream, some uh, some heads distillate, low, uh, light heads distillate is probably collected and fed back to the heads column. I'm not tracing this out exactly. I don't see it offhand, but I think that's the way it go. And, uh, <clears throat> and um, perhaps a fusel oil cut would be drawn off and returned back to the fusel oil column. But you see the distillate from the extraction column, the middle one there, the large middle one, and that probably is realistically to sort of to scale because if you're going to run a high volume water through there you've got to have a lot of a rather large volume because you're going to pass through a lot of liquid all, all the spirits plus all the water that's associated with it so that distillate then is fed to the fusel oil column and uh, fusel oil is concentrated and separated and, and uh, from that so uh, time is up, and then I, as I say next uh, <clears throat> Tuesday, um, Professor Lewis is, is having more to say, particularly about molding and yeasting in the in the green spirits.